We learned in the previous screencast that the elements of the periodic table are organized according to increasing atomic number, so that elements with similar properties are in the same vertical column or group. What's interesting is that when you do this, the length of each period corresponds to their electron configurations. So for example, in period 1, the 1s sublevels being filled. Now a 1s orbital can only hold two electrons, so period 1 is only two elements across. When you're going across the second period, the 2s and 2p sublevels are being filled. Remember that 2s can only hold two electrons, while 2p can hold up to six. So the second period on the periodic table will hold a total of eight elements. The same is true for period three. You're filling 3s and 3p for a total of eight elements. Now when you move across the fourth period on the periodic table, the sublevels being filled are 4s, 3d, and 4p. S's again can hold two electrons. D's, however, can hold 10, and P's again hold 6 for a grand total of 18 electrons or 18 elements across period 4 of the periodic table. This pattern continues throughout the periodic table so that the periodic table can be divided into four blocks, the S block, P block, D block, and F block, and that's determined by what sublevel is being filled by the elements in that block. So all the elements in the first two columns, group 1 and group 2, are in the S block because their electron configurations end with S. All of the elements in the P block, which are on the far right side of the table, their electron configurations end in P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, or P6, which is why that block is six elements across. All the elements in the D block can hold up to 10 electrons in their outermost orbital, whereas the F block ends with the sublevel F, which can hold 14 electrons. The alkali metals are group one of the S block. They have a silvery appearance and are very soft. You can actually cut them with a knife or take your fingernail and make a dent in them. They are highly reactive, so they are not found naturally as free elements, and they readily combine with nonmetals on the periodic table. Because they are highly reactive, they react violently with water, and therefore they must be stored in oil to prevent them from reacting. The reason they're so reactive is because they easily lose their outermost electrons in order to become more stable. The other group of the S block is the alkaline earth metals. They're group two. They are a little bit harder, denser, and stronger than the group one elements, and they also have a higher melting point. They are also slightly less reactive than the group one alkaline metals but they're still too reactive to be found as free elements and are also most likely found in compounds. Hydrogen is kind of the odd element of the S block. It's only placed in group one due to its electron configuration of 1s1, but it doesn't really share any properties with the group one alkali metals. Hydrogen is actually a nonmetal, and it is highly explosive gas. Helium is also technically part of the S block because its outermost electron shell is completely full with an electron configuration of 1s2, but it's placed in group 18 due to its chemical properties. It is an inert, unreactive gas, just like the other noble gases. The D block contains the transition metals. These metals are slightly less reactive than groups 1 and 2. They are also harder and have higher melting points than the S block. What's interesting about the transition metals is they form a variety of colored ions when they're placed into solutions. Most of the brightly colored solutions that we use in lab are because of the transition metals of the D block. The transition metals generally have incomplete D subshells, so like D1, D2, D3, D4, and so on. There are many of the transition metals that actually fill their electron orbitals irregularly, although they still will have the lowest energy arrangement according to the off-ball principle. When you look at the electron configuration for chromium, for example, you would think based on its periodic table location that its electron configuration would be 4s2, 3d4, but it's actually 4s1, 3d5. The same is true for copper, as well as the elements niobium, through silver of period five. When the transition metals lose electrons, they tend to lose those S sublevel electrons first. 
forming ions with a plus one or a plus two charge. And then they begin to lose their d electrons next. This variation in the loss of electrons causes a wide variety of oxidation states in the transition metals. So for example, copper can actually lose one or two of its S subshell electrons, meaning that you can have copper ions with a one plus charge, or you can have copper ions with a two plus charge. And this causes slightly different shades of blue when those copper ions are in solution. Now the main group elements are all of the elements that are in the P block and the S block. Sometimes these main group elements are also called the representative elements. While the S block are all metals that are highly reactive, the elements of the P block have properties that vary greatly. As you move from left to right, the elements change from metals to semi-metals and then finally non-metals. So if I move across period three in the P block, I begin with aluminum, which is a metal, and has all the properties of a metal, being malleable, ductile, good conductors of electricity, good conductors of heat. The next element is silicon, which is a semi-metal. Still looks like a metal in that it's lustrous and silvery, but is not as good of a conductor and is considered a semiconductor, which makes it very popular for use in computers. The next element across the P block is phosphorus. Phosphorus is a nonmetal, so notice that the color of phosphorus is different, as well as the crystalline structure of phosphorus is different, so that it is not malleable or ductile like aluminum and silicon. The next element is sulfur, which is also a nonmetal and is even more brittle than phosphorus. If I continue one element over, I get to chlorine, which is a gas. Chlorine is a member of the halogen family. The halogens are group 17 on the periodic table and they are the most reactive nonmetals on the periodic table. The reason they are so reactive is because they easily gain one electron in order to become more stable. Because they are highly reactive, they combine readily with metals to form compounds called salts. Now the halogens at the top of the periodic table are gases, but as you move down the halogen group, they become more dense. So chlorine is a gas, whereas bromine, which is shown here in the middle, is a brownish liquid, whereas iodine is a purple crystalline solid. The last group of the P block are the noble gases. The noble gases are found in group 18, and they are all similar in that they are completely inert or unreactive. They include elements like helium, neon, argon, and krypton. Because they are unreactive, they are often found in lights. The reason that these gases are unreactive is because their outermost electron shell is completely full. Remember, helium has an electron configuration of 1s2, and that would be a completely full subshell. Neon is also a noble gas, and its electron configuration has sublevels that are also completely full. And all of those orbitals contain two electrons, giving it a full octet of electrons. And that octet of electrons is what makes it stable. The last block of the periodic table, the F block, contains the lanthanide and actinide series. The lanthanide series is made up of shiny metals that are very similar in reactivity to the alkaline earth metals. Because they're similar in their reactivity, they are inserted next to them on the periodic table. The actinide series is found in period 7 of the periodic table, and all of these elements are radioactive. The reason they're radioactive is because their nucleus is too large. They have too many protons and neutrons packed into a tiny space that the strong nuclear force is not strong enough to hold that element together, and so the nucleus begins to fall apart or decay. There are lots of different types of radioactive decay, including alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma particles. Only the first four elements of the actinide series are found in nature. Those include actinium, thorium, protactinium, and uranium. Uranium is the compound that is commonly used in nuclear power plants as a source of energy.